Our first scripture this morning comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from hurt and harm. And God granted what he asked. Holy words for God's people. In our second reading in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus uses a parable about workers in a vineyard to help his followers understand what the kingdom of heaven is like. As you hear the text read aloud, listen carefully and think about what Jesus might want us to learn from this parable. Does this text challenge your own understanding of God's kingdom? And now from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Holy words for God's people. Thank you, Alan. When I was growing up, I loved to watch televangelists with my grandparents. Have y'all ever done that before? I remember sitting in front of the television, and back then, it was when you clicked the channels versus click the channels. And I, I remember sitting next to my grandparents on the couch, and they had their Bibles open that were larger than life, way bigger than the one we have here, and full of the margins were notes of all the things that they had thought about and prayed about and how God was teaching them. And I remember sitting with them as they worshiped and prayed and sang along with whoever was the preacher on TV that day. Looking back, I've come to realize that so much of my theology began by experiencing and sitting in their theology. I didn't understand until much later in life that what we were witnessing on TV, at least for the ones I saw growing up, is now known as the gospel of prosperity. Now, I would call the prosperity gospel, it mainly caught on fire, got really popular around the 1950s. And I would describe this theology as a belief that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. God wants to fulfill our destiny which is that all the wonderfulness of life would be lavished upon you. It's a bless me theology. Because if we pray right, if we believe enough, 
then God will bless me and make me rich and healthy. This type of theology I like to refer to as Spockin' theology. Have y'all ever seen the original Star Trek series? Live long. Oh my gosh. Y'all just greeted me back. <laughs> I'm going to retire tomorrow. It was good serving you. How's it go? Live long and... It's a show from the 70s, but still rings true today, right? 60s? All right, all right, I hear you. Y'all are talking today. That's good. Maybe I'll hear an amen this morning, Pastor Sarah. I don't know. Watch out. So here's how this goes. If we live long enough and we live healthy lives with loads and loads of money, surely that's a sign that God is lavishing grace upon us. Surely that means that God loves us more. One of my favorite theologians, whom I absolutely invite you to read, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm pretty sure he would call this cheap grace. It's cheap because it requires very little discipleship as a follower of Jesus. You and I can recognize the prosperity gospel in a number of ways. One of my earliest encounters was when I picked up a book and taught it to a bunch of high schoolers when I was a youth director at the tender age of 18. This book is called The Prayer of Jabez, written by Bruce Wilkinson. We heard the entire prayer this morning as Alan read it to us. You may have missed it. Increase my territory. Fundamentally, I struggle with any theology that is born out of a single verse that can easily be taken out of context, and I believe that's what happened here in this book. The Prayer of Jabez was released in 2000 and quickly became one of the best-selling Christian books of all time. In its first eight years, it sold over 10 million books. I helped buy a couple dozen myself. You see, we can find this type of theology when we are asked to pray long enough, to believe hard enough, and to believe that God will bless me because God wants to bless me if only I had enough faith because it's about me being healthy and wealthy. Is there a problem with the prosperity gospel? A gospel that teaches that God wants what's best for me? That God wants me to have lots of money and to have great health? Is there something wrong with God wanting to be generous with me? Let's take a look at our scripture reading this morning. Now, I want to encourage you, whenever you hear, no matter what church you go to, wherever you go, if you hear scripture read, always check out the first chapter before and at least the next chapter after because it always gives us context to what's happening here. So in Matthew chapter 19, about seven verses before what was read to us this morning, Jesus is telling his disciples that to be a follower of Jesus means giving up everything. That we can find Jesus over and over again in the gospel messages sharing that to be a follower of Jesus means being a generous person. Never do we find Jesus telling people, God wants to bless you with riches and great health. I couldn't find it. I even Googled it. <laughs> Try it. Instead, we see Jesus teaching his disciples to share abundantly. The first shall be last, and the last will be first. This is what frames our gospel reading this morning, which leads us to where we are. So here we have Jesus telling a story, which is really what parables are. It's a modern day way of enhancing what he's trying to teach his followers and any who would listen. And this is a story about the usual wage that he gives to all the people no matter when they showed up. Now, what's the usual wage? There's lots of fun Greek we can play with. Is it denarii? What is a denarii? How much is it? It doesn't really matter the amount. The truth is, Whatever amount that was agreed upon is what everyone believed was fair at the start of the day or whenever they were hired. So picture the landowner going to the local Home Depot parking lot early in the morning because that's really about what he was talking about in that time. And at noon, in a third hour, and about an hour before the end of the workday. Now, we all have to stop and ask the obvious question, what about these folks who were hired at 5 p.m. about an hour before everything would end? Some theologians suggest that they were willing to work but were ignored. Others suggest that maybe these are the folks who, as we heard in our call to worship, woke up a bit late and didn't get there till 5 o'clock. What if these were the kind of people that nobody wanted to hire, that nobody felt safe bringing to their labor, to their farm, or to their home? 
I'd also like to believe that isn't just about why those people were there at five, but maybe these were the people who chose to not give up. Even with most of the day gone, for whatever reason, they're there at 5 p.m. They're hoping that they could make what little they could to survive for whomever they needed to take care of in that moment, even if it's just one hour of pay. Now, in Numbers and Leviticus, throughout Jewish law, we can see that there are rules and expectations on how you are to treat workers. Fair wages for a hard day's work. That's a biblical principle. So, as we heard, as Ellen read to us this morning, at first, nobody complained. That is, until their expectations changed. I wonder how the story might have gone if Jesus reversed the order for the manager in 20 verse 8, if he started paying those who worked the longest. I wonder how it might have gone for those who worked a full day, got exactly what they were expecting, and walked away smiling, knowing nothing more. Well, that's not how the story goes, is it? Jesus has a lesson to teach us. And I love the response of those who believed that they now deserve more after seeing others get a fair day's wage. Here's the response. These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching of the heat. Now, can you hear the accusatory tone of those who are talking to the manager? You have made them equal to us. The problem with the prosperity gospel is when some have more, others have to have less. I love the way the landowner responds. The landowner understands why they're upset, but firmly states the truth. Everyone received exactly what they agreed to. Everyone is treated as equal. No one is treated unjustly because justice and fairness are not the same thing. This is not a story about fairness. This is not a story about people getting what they deserve. This is a story about everyone getting more than they deserve. This is a parable not about those who work hard enough to earn their daily wage. It's a story about God who is generous. Theologian Alistair, Alice McKenzie summarized th this way. The generosity of God reverses our way of thinking. And to me, verse 15, that's the point. Here's how it reads. Are you envious because I am generous? You see, I think it's tempting to treat God's generosity like a beautifully, freshly baked pie. Each slice is delicious and wonderful, but if I brought one pie and said, this is for everybody in our sanctuary this morning, if we're honest, we'd all be wondering, is there enough? Because we believe there couldn't be enough pie to go around. Share too much and somebody will be left out. I am so grateful that God's grace is not limited by our imaginations. I wonder if we limit God's grace to our own understanding of God's generosity because when we limit God's grace to our definition of fairness, we forget who we are worshiping because we are worshiping Jesus who was born poor, an immigrant who had to flee to Egypt because his life was in danger who taught us to give away all that we have for those in the greatest need. The gospel of prosperity is something that we are witnessing in abundance this very day. It's a theology that tells us that you get what you deserve. But look just a few layers deeper, and the gospel of prosperity begins with me and offers very little depth beyond a narcissistic theology. I've known many people who truly buy into the prosperity gospel and are incredibly generous to anyone that they meet. Generosity is great as long as we are the recipients of it or the ones who are giving it away. The problem is this type of theology starts and ends with me. And the abundant grace of God has nothing to do with what we earn or deserve or even inherit 
God's generosity reverses our way of thinking from a place of scarcity to a place of abundance. One problem with the gospel of prosperity is that it takes God completely out of the equation. God who loves us in scarcity and abundance. God who sits with us through every season of our life. Another problem is that the prosperity gospel falls apart the moment life begins to get tough. Now with permission, I'm going to share just a tiny bit of one family story in our church. One family in our church has experienced great abundance and enjoyed a large salary and all the perks that have gone along with it in their life. But that was then, and this is now. Now they're doing their best to live on one salary, far below six figures, far below the poverty line, and one parent is currently battling cancer. This is a family that is beautiful and faithful to one another, and I believe they are honest-to-goodness followers of Jesus. Did they do something to deserve these immense struggles that they are going through right now, facing decisions about whether they can pay their mortgage or pay for life-saving medication or even the next test to know what lies next for them? No. Absolutely nothing in Scripture hints at this lie that they deserve what is happening to them right now because they do not. Much of their situation is out of their control. Out of their control. And here we have our current administration pulling away the Affordable Care Act, and it's getting scarier and scarier for this beautiful family, and that is not always in their control. If the prosperity gospel says that you get what you deserve because God wants you to be blessed, logic dictates, tells us that you get what you deserve if you are not blessed, if you don't have great wealth, if you don't have great money. If life turns a page on you that you can't deserve, then you must deserve it, and I just don't buy it. Because what about all those families who this very week are being torn apart thanks to ICE arrests that are happening from East Coast to West Coast, what do we say to our friends and families who are afraid to leave their homes or get on social media for fear of a door that knocks that will take their parent away? Does somehow God love these people less because they are undocumented? I want to tell you, that every time you sniff the prosperity gospel, you should run the other way. But it's not as simple as that. I wish it was. And the truth is, it rarely is. Watching televangelists wasn't the only time I worshipped with my grandparents. I got to be with my grandparents throughout their much of their ministry. Initially, my grandparents left a very lucrative business to go into ministry, and I got to see them be generous in many ways. They sang hymns and prayed and studied scripture every morning and night when it was just the two of them. I watched my grandparents preach and teach to massive crowds. They fed the hungry and were generous when they thought no one was looking except for a young boy who saw more. Now, just because they like televangelists, and I think bought into the prosperity gospel, it didn't make them bad people. It didn't make them bad theologians. Bad theology does not make bad people. Please hear me correctly. There's danger in the prosperity gospel. It's dangerous theology that teaches us that we get what we deserve for God who says, I love you because you're my beloved. Deep down, we are all tempted to want to be heroes of our own story. But if you want to be a hero of your story, you can only be a hero if you have a villain. We live in a world where it is becoming far too easy to vilify other. The prosperity gospel makes you and I the deserving hero. And as we look at scripture, even in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus' parable of the landowner never vilifies one person. It's a story of the abundant generosity of God that reverses our way of thinking where everyone is equal, not by right, but by God. It's a story that invites us to see beyond our own needs, to move beyond our imagination, and see that there is much more. 
I don't buy into a theology that vilifies others as simple as a comic book may, nor one that judges people based off of how much money they have or how little money they have. I do believe that we will all be held responsible for how generous we are with what we have in our hands. Maybe a modern twist on the first shall be last and the last shall be first might be better written as this. God loves all of us whether you are in line or not. I pray for a day when our world no longer reflects the prosperity gospel. I pray for a day when we begin to reflect a gospel that says all are equal, are a beloved, all are God's creation. A gospel that gives everyone more than they deserve because we are all God's. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who loves us more than our imaginations. Thanks be to God who sees more than what we see. May it be so today. May it be so tomorrow. Amen.